Okay, perfect. So, hello everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back to this lecture on particle physics. Please don't run yet. Um, in particular, this talk is about particular physics phenomenology, which is as bad as a word as a subject. And today, uh, I want to talk about these neutrinos. Okay, these these particles. Um, I really want to explain you why they will solve all the mysteries in the universe. It's like all, all physics talk in particle physics. No, but now in all seriousness, I really want to explain to you why we think that these neutrinos are really worth your time. And by we, I mean the people whose job and money depends on neutrinos, like me. And by your time, I mean just 20 minutes. So let's do this. The first point uh, about neutrino physics is that neutrinos are very sneaky. They are very ghostly. From the three standard model forces, from the strong force, electromagnetic force, and weak force, they only interact through the weak force, which, surprise, is very weak. And in order for you to imagine this, I want you to begin this talk with, a, with an image in your head. And I want you to imagine a wall, a wall made of lead. Lead is the densest metal out there. And I want you to imagine a wall which is one light year thick, okay? A one light year thick wall made of lead. And I want you to shoot a mental um, beam of neutrinos through it. Of all these neutrinos, only one out of two will be stopped by this wall of lead. Because they are very, 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 very interact poorly with matter. Of course, it depends on the energy of the neutrino, but this is just a global picture. And in the same way that they interact very poorly with matter, they, for example, cross the Earth from one side to another without noticing. Okay? Right now, you can imagine that you are being crossed with neutrinos that come from, for example, from the Taj Mahal in India, or from the Sao Paulo Cristo Redentor, or just a more humorous example, the cute and smelly ass of an African baboon. Just as an example, but it's a bit scary. And in the same way that neutrinos cross the Earth without noticing, they also cross our detectors without noticing. That means that they are very difficult to detect. And that is, that is of course, very troublesome. But it is also very fortunate because it means that they bring information from very far away. That is, for example, from thousands of kilometers from the other side of the Earth or from the other side of the universe. So this is why neutrinos are so interesting. And then, um, if they are so interesting and they bring so much information so, from so far away, if they interact so poorly, how it is that we can measure them? How it is that we can detect them? So the thing is that we are lucky with this, is that there are a lot of them, like a lot, a lot, a lot of them. Just to imagine again, in, the, in, your, in your hand, in the skin of your thumb, every second there are 65 billion crossing your skin, only in your thumb. So there are a lot of them. And even if they interact so poorly, the huge amounts of them makes them then one or two allowed to make a measurable detection. And this is very important. And just as a, to finish this brief introduction on neutrinos, let us just remember what are the neutrino sources that we know. Neutrinos, for example, are usually produced in single beta decay, like we can see here. This, is, this laser is what applied physics is for. And we are seeing that a, neutri a neutron decays and shoots a neutrino. And in the same way that a single beta decay can produce neutrinos, nuclear reactors, for example, are the most powerful artificial source of neutrinos. And we can use them to study neutrinos. But the most powerful natural source that we know is the sun here. And in the same way that the sun can produce neutrinos, we expect the rest of the stars to also produce neutrinos. And in the same way, in the very early universe, also we expect that neutrinos had been produced and therefore that a relic distribution of neutrinos exists in our universe, what we call the neutrino cosmic background. So let's stop here for a second and notice that neutrinos are important not only, not, no, they are not only an obsession of particle physicists, which also they are, but they are also very important in nuclear physics, in astrophysics, and in cosmology. So this touches everything that the ICC uses. So we might begin to see why the neutrinos are a little bit worth your time. Okay, so what more about them? Neutrinos, as we know them, there are three of them. There are what we call the three flavors of neutrinos. There are the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. So these are our tricky names. Why do, we call it, well, why do we call them like this? 
because when an electron neutrino is, pr is produced in a weak process, you are for sure that in this same process there will be an electron or a positron. This is what we call the lepton number conservation. And the same thing happens with mu neutrinos and tau neutrinos. They always come in pairs. And this is very important. This is why we say that the flavor is conserved. But you see that there's some italic in here because this conservation is a bit tricky. This is what brings us to the point of this talk, to what we will call neutrino oscillations. Okay? But in order to answer this question, what do we mean with neutrino oscillations, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to basic quantum mechanics. And let's go back to something very simple, just a quantum state. Okay? And I want you to imagine not only as an arbitrary quantum state, but a quantum state which is not an energy eigenstate. That is, it is made of, of different states which are energy eigenstates. We have their energy defined. When this state evolves in time, what will happen? Well, each part of this state, only from basic quantum mechanics, will evolve with its own phase. For example, this one here will evolve with more slowly, and the other one here will evolve more faster. So the original state, which for example had coefficients 1 and 1, after some evolution, different evolution of one part and the other, it may evolve, for example, into 1 minus 1. So the original state, which was not an energy eigenstate, state, on its own has evolved into another state, and in particular to an orthogonal state. So states which are not energy eigenstates evolve into, do not remain the same all the time. And in order to see this a little bit more rigorously, we can plot, for example, the probability of, after some time t, what's the probability of this state being measured and remaining the same as it in the, in the start, is in the origin. When we measure this, we obtain the following. You see that the state goes back and forth, this is just an, an illustration, goes back and forth between one state and the orthogonal, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The probability of measuring it is not always one. It changes to another one. And this is what we see in this oscillation here. Okay? This happens in all quantum states which are not energy eigenstates. For example, also in chaos physics with nuclear, with nuclear physics. So it's nothing so exotic. It's basic standard quantum mechanics. But what does has this to do with neutrinos? So everything. And in order to go back again to answer this question, we, I wanted to, to go to an experiment which was uh, some years ago. I don't know if I was born. Um, it is a super Kamikande, Kamikande experiment, which was studying the neutrino flux from the sun. It was studying the, the flux, the amount of neutrinos of its flavor that came from the sun. And it compared this observation to the theoretical prediction of the solar models. And what this experiment was seeing is that the amounts of its flavor were different. They did not match. For example, this is just an oversimplified example. They were seeing, for example, less tau neutrinos than expected and more mu neutrinos than expected. Again, just a simplification. So there, there was a problem here. There was a mismatch. Either the theoretical prediction was wrong, which was not really true, or something was missing. And this is the time for you to think what is going on here. So if you are following a bit, you understand that what was going on here is that the flavor of neutrinos from the sun just an example, from the sun to the earth was changing. This experiment, this mismatch could be explained by allowing the neutrinos to change flavor, to oscillate. For example, a tau neutrino could go to a mu neutrino and in this distance, in this propagation, to change to another flavor and then it could match the observations. So this was introduced in the experiment and a lot of more um, experiments also confirmed the same uh, hypothesis this won a Nobel Prize. So what is this telling us? This is telling us that, remember, oscillation happened for states which are not energy against states. So this is telling us that the neutrino flavor is not an energy against state. Okay. So this is telling us that neutrino flavors are different from energy against states. And in special relativity, when we talk about energy, it is almost the same as saying mass. 
So we are saying that neutrinos, neutrino, for example, an electron neutrino, a mion neutrino, a tau neutrino, does not have its mass correctly defined. Okay? This is a very important conclusion from neutrino oscillations, is that not only do they have their mass undefined, but, and that is even more important, they have a mass. And this is something, as Inigo has told have told us before, that the standard model did not account for. In the standard model, neutrinos are massless. And here, neutrino solutions finally discovered, finally proved that neutrinos have mass. Where does it come from? Well, that's an important question, which we'll maybe try to solve now. And just as a, a break of all my energy I have, um, this, I want you to notice that this affects a lot of interdisciplinary physics. For example, in supernovas, it is very important to notice how is the flux of neutrinos coming from supernovas, because the interaction of such neutrinos with matter, because there's so dense matter there, will, uh, will tell us a lot of hints about what, what new physics could there be. Or for example, in cosmology, the number of neutrinos or the mass of such neutrinos will affect a lot the evolution of the universe. So again, this is not only think of particle physics. What's what I like about neutrinos. So, in order to briefly, well, to finish my thesis, my, my talk, let's talk a little bit about what research could be done with this. What new physics could neutrino oscillations unveil? And to answer this, let's go back to how does neutrino oscillations work. So, the experiment is quite easy. You have a reactor source in one point, you produce a neutrino flux, the neutrino flux travels some distance, and then you detect it at a, far, at a far distance. And then you can tell that the distance of the neutrino propagation is very important. And also, of course, the energy. This allows us to plot the, all the possible experiments in this plot of energy of the neutrino and the distance that the neutrino traveled. For example, here the, there would be thousands of kilometers, for example, the diameter of the Earth, and to a few meters, and from MeV to G TeV. So there's a whole wide range here. Of all this whole wide range, I want you to, to, to take a look at this experiment here, which is called the LSND. Let's make a zoom out of it. And as you can see in the photo, as by the looks of this guy, this experiment is a little bit old, when, back when fashion was not discovered yet. And as you can see this experiment, the liquid, the liquid scintillator, scintillator um, neutrino detector, what they saw is uh, what we call an excess of electron antineutrino. That is, they were seeing, they were observing more electron antineutrino than expected. Than expected from what? Well, even taking into account the standard model oscillation, that is, oscillations from the three neutrinos, electron, muon, and tau, they could not explain this excess of antineutrinos. This was something important, and let me show you why. Because by this red line, this yellow line here, here I, I showed the probability of after some distance of thousands of meters, kilometers, some 20 V neutrino, the probability uh, does not change a lot because it is a short distance. The neutrino, according only to standard oscillation, has not had the time to oscillate. So this excess of the LSND could not be explained only by the standard oscillations. You need something more. For example, a possible interpretation, I don't mean that it's the only one, a possible interpretation would be that there is a new frequency on such oscillations. There is a much, a much faster oscillation which allows in a shorter distance to the neutrinos to change flavor to something. And therefore, this could explain that in such a shorter distance, some neutrinos could appear or disappear in other experiments. So, however, if we have a new oscillation frequency, a new oscillation, we need something to oscillate to. And this is where um, scientists, physicists, particle physicists, propose the existence of a sterile neutrino. A new neutrino to which to oscillate to. If you have a new neutrino and this neutrino is more massive, then the oscillation, the change in flavor, will be faster and will allow you to, even at such a short distance, to have an excess of neutrinos. But with that ends, Valentin. Sure. Super. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, I'm three here. Super. So, um, this new flavor eigenstate is what was called the sterile neutrino. 
OK? And why do we call it a sterile neutrino? What does it mean that it is a sterile? So actually, from the LHC experiments, for example, the, the decay, the Z boson, we know very, very, very well that there are only three neutrinos which interact with the weak force, the electron, muon, and tau that we know. So if we want to add any new neutrino, experiments tell us that it cannot interact via the weak force. And this is why we add a new neutrino, which holds no charge, which is a singlet of SU2, and therefore which does not interact via the weak force. Whoops, sorry. And therefore, the only possible way um, to um, study this neutrino, this sterile neutrino, would be through oscillations. Or for example, but that's a topic for another talk, um, through gravity. It should also interact through gravity, and then could form, make, take part of that matter. But as you can tell, this, this would be long. Then, um, we have a new, sterile, a new hypothetical particle that could explain this experiment, the LSND. But what about the rest of experiments? There are a lot of experiments on neutrinos, and a lot of them are trying to take a look at this sterile neutrino. This, all of these here, for example, are sensitive to such neutrino. And as you can see, the LSND here was indeed seeing a signal of such oscillation. And this here, this mini boon, quite years later, also found a very similar signal, also compatible with such interpretation. Also, there were other experiments, for example, these ones here, Best, Sage, and Galax, which also found some evidence that could be that an, a new neutrino could, could happen, that this, that this fast oscillation could be there. So there seems that the signal, instead of disappearing, has been repeated in other experiments. But let's be honest here, in the global picture, when you consider all experiments around, the things for the sterile neutrino are bad. They are pretty bad because there are um, different results from different experiments which are in contradiction between them. For example, one restrains a uh, uh, part of the parameter space, which is allowed by another. So uh, it looks like the, the sterile neutrino is a little bit not dead, but it's not favored in the global picture. However, and this is where my research comes in, and me and Jordi Salvador here, we have recently um, published an, an article on, on archive. And what we are telling is that when these experiments are taking a look at their, at their analysis, at their data, what they see, what they use, sorry, is the approximation that the neutrino is a plane wave. That is this thing here. That the neutrino can be modeled by a perfectly, with a perfect energy and obviously um, spread in space infinitely. You know that particles cannot be interpreted correctly by plane waves. This is not a, I mean, this, is, this does not look like a particle. So this approximation works well in some scenarios, but what we have seen is that you need to go farther with the sterile neutrinos. You need to consider that they are not a plane wave, but that they are a wave packet. That is something with an extension. When you consider this, this is just a basic quantum mechanics result, nothing exotic here. It is possible, it is possible in some parameter space to reduce the tension between experiments. What looks like a death for the sterile neutrino, uh, maybe it's not that much. And this is what I'm showing here in this my final picture. This here, these um, lines here, um, are exclusion contours from re nuclear reactor experiments, okay? Of the parameter space of the mass and the mixing of the sterile neutrino, doesn't really matter. These are exclusion contours from the nuclear reactors. And these are preferred regions from the best experiment, which is also from nuclear decay, but a little bit different. And as you can see, in the plane wave approximation, this green contour here, the results are in quite tension. I mean, it's difficult for both results to be right at the same time despite for this tiny region here. While, if you consider the wave packet, this basic quantum mechanic effect, you get that there's a region here which may be a lot, and the tension reduces, the, reduces a little bit. So this, what this is telling us is that we must be careful with the approximations that we do when analyzing, analyzing this, this kind of experiments. And this is the neutrino that we, that we thought it was so dead. Well, maybe it's not that much. Thank you very much, and please ask any question. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, Thanks, yeah. We have quite a uh, well, lot of time for questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So yeah, it, it's just undergraduate level question. So I, I, I got surprised for the fact that I, I can states of energy and flavor, uh, well, ones are not the others. So I, for in, in a, I don't know, a, a reaction, I don't know, proton electron goes to neutron and antineutrino. So I, I, if you can, so you, you, you know that the final state will have electron flavor. Mm -hmm. I, if you can measure the initial energies of the particles and the final energy of the neutron, does it look like both energy and flavor are are more or less w well defined? How does it deal yeah, with that? Yeah, that's a very, 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 very good question. Yeah, you, I think he's asking whether um, if we could be able to detect the energy or the mass of the initial neutrino, of the neutrino that we're looking, this would have a, an ambivalence, right? This, what are we collapsing, the flavor or the mass? Exactly, that's a very good question. And the answer is quite simple. Experimentally, um, there's a loss of the coherence. I mean, when, when a neutrino is expelled, in principle, the way to calculate the mass would be from the recoil of the nucleus, right? The thing is that, um, experimentally, the nucleus um, quickly collides with the rest of the nucleus in the environment, and then um, the coherence is lost. And then it is not possible yet to measure the mass. However, one sh could design an experiment. Yes, of course. I think it's out of experimental reach, though. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. This means that someone has <laughs> understood. <laughs> so, probably also a naive question, but why is the weight packet needed for the sterile neutrino and not for the others? Very good question. Um, one of the effects that we have found, okay, is that when you consider a wave packet, since one states are more massive than the others, the states that are more massive will propagate slowly. And the states that are more lighter will propagate faster, right? And therefore, the wave packets, in if the neutrino, one neutrino is very heavy, it could separate, of course. And then instead of going all together like a plane wave, it goes to split it. And then when you detect it, you detect only a split wave, a split wave function. And therefore, the, the, the probability kind of shrinks because you are not getting the totality of the wave function. And therefore, um, in the case of the sterile neutrino, since it is much more massive than the standard neutrinos, it could, this effect could be, more, could be worse because one is much more heavier, then it will go much more slowly. And in the case of standard, in standard oscillations, it would not be so. So, very good question again. Uh, some time for one more question. Well, when you say mm -hmm. much more massive, uh, how much are we talking about? Like 100 times more massive than? Yeah, for example, here in this plot, um, this shows the y-axis is roughly the mass of the sterile neutrino. And as you can see, um, it is around 10 to the minus 1 EV squared, which is mass squared, and 10, mass squ and 10 EV squares. Okay, this would be the, po the possible ranges of these, this signal. And the, for example, the tau neutrino, the mass eigenstate associated to it would be 10 to the minus 3 electron volts squared. So it's an order of 3, this 